Good morning. Let's uh, begin the session. Uh, my name is Andreu Mascolei, and it is an honor for me uh, to present today uh, Professor Itzhak Gilboa on the occasion of the delivery of the 2023 Schumpeter Lecture of the European Economic Association uh, with the title Reasoning in Face of Uncertainty. Professor uh, Gilboa was born in Tel Aviv and graduate, graduated in economics and in mathematics at the University of Tel Aviv, where he also got uh, his PhD in economics in 1987 under the direction of the late and much missed uh, David Schmeigler. From 87 to 97, he developed his career up to the level of full professor at the Kellogg uh, School at Northwestern University. From 98, he's a professor at the University of Tel Aviv, and from 2008, also at HOC Paris, where from 2010, he holds the AXA Chair of Decision Sciences. He has been a Sloan Fellow, and he's a Fellow of the Econometric Society and an international honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In his web page, uh, Isaac Gilboa describes his intellectual proclivities as follow, I quote, I work in decision theory and other fields in economic theory, such as game theory and social choice. My main interest is in decision under uncertainty, focusing on the definition of probability, no, of probability notions of rationality, non-Bayesian decision models, and related uh, issues. He does not say it, but I can. Uh, he does all this with brilliance, depth, and originality. While, as it is true of all of us, Gilboa and a distinguished roster of collaborators, which includes Smiler, builds on the shoulders of giants, they, non non they nonetheless use the opportunity to batter their heads. Indeed, they had the intellectual courage to look eye to eye to Savage or Anscom uh, Aumann I now realize now that my rhetoric is carrying me too far because physically to batter the head from the shoulder and to look out to eye is a bit difficult. Uh, but uh, you, get, uh, you get my drift. Uh, anyhow, they, they look eye to eye to Savage or Anscom Aumann, magnificent axiomatic foundation of Bayesian decision theory, and to say aloud that it was too good to be true, that the, that the anomalies and paradoxes Elvis says, for example, had to be taken very seriously. Yet, uh, they were very aware that it takes a theory to replace a theory, and a good theory to replace such a good and extremely elegant theory as Savage's. In the task of constructing an alternative decision theory, Gilboa and collaborators have themselves appealed to the axiomatic method and provided theoretical tools that, not, that do not impose the rigid and no doubt unrealistic discipline of postulating that decision makers act as if they attach defined probabilities to everything conceivable, that is, to an exhaustive listing of states of the world, an hypothesis that, let's be frank, is difficult to swallow as a universal uh, principle. Uh, professor, I put the emphasis on universal. Uh, Prof professor Gilboa likes to say that the Bayesian approach is good at representing knowledge, but poor at representing ignorance. One direction taken by Gilboa and collaborators is to incorporate in ambiguity in decision theory. They, they do it by first replacing the postulate of one prior by one of a complex set of priors, and second, by, under stronger axioms, ordering completely the possible acts by a max-mean criterion. The utility of one act is the minimum expected utility over the different admissible probabilities. The result is elegant and as simple to work with as the case where the set of admissible probabilities is a singleton, which is Savage's case, yet it allows to handle interesting phenomena Savage cannot handle, such as ambiguity aversion. Gilboa, however, is not content of comfortable with living matters with approaches that rest on using probabilities indirectly derived from acts. That led him, at Schmeiler, to develop the theory of case-based decision theory, which has had a notable impact. We saw it yesterday in the presidential address, for example, in their think, Econometric, uh, uh, European Economic Association presidential address. In their thinking, 
if this fits uh, with objective probabilities and uncertainty with the visualization of an exhaustive li listing of states of the world, decision under ignorance would proceed by appealing to the memory of similar cases. Instead of states of the world, we will have memories. Instead of subjective probabilities, a quantitative measure of similarity. And the evaluation of acts will proceed by adding up, weighted by the similarity, the payoff of the action, of the action in the memories where it was used. To develop the theory, Gilboa used with mastery the axiomatic method of long traditions in economics, but also tools of statistics and computational complexity theory. His publications and his book with Schmeiler, Case-Based Decision Theory, show by a variety of applications, for example, to consumer theory, the relevance and the power of the new theory. Interestingly, the concept of case-based inf uh, inference uh, received as its origin influence of the first phase of uh, uh, artificial intelligence research and the current developments ar ar arising from the work of Gilboa links with the current one. Obviously, I cannot summarize the fertile landscape of Gilbert's research. Let me just say that reading his presentation and papers stimulates the imagination, and for me, it opens so many lines of inquiry that confirms what I think was a remark of Paul Samuelson. He was referring to revealed preference and commenting on George's, res on George's correction. There are few topics one can be sure they will be discussed 100 years from now. Decision theory is one of them. Professor Gilboa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andreu. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? I mean, this, Before I... Saki delivers his amazing lecture, this is the time to announce the Young Economist Award, but I want to say no, no, Andreu is perfect. I want to say that when we chose uh, Andreu to introduce uh, Saki, we knew that his introduction would be delivered with brilliance and grace. Thank you so much for your introduction. And uh, why we decided to have the Young Economist Award before the Schumpeter Lecture? Exactly because Andreu and Saki are among the scholars who have been most generous with young scholars. So we felt it was exactly the right moment. So uh, I would need the slides, very few. You know that I'm brief. Excellent. So it's a huge honor for the European Economic Association to have the fortune and the privilege to have the support of the UniCredit Research Foundation. That's a beautiful foundation whose main core, basically, is to provide, you can see here, a list of scholarships, fellowships, grants, and awards. I really strongly advise you to go to their website, find the details, some of these grants awards uh, fellowship are now the calls for applications and especially those of you on the job market this year there is a beautiful program geared toward you for the best paper on students on the job market so please remember to apply what's the common features of these awards grants and scholarship that the unicredit foundation provides and this is why we love you literally their mission is to foster the careers of young people, junior people, and to reward your talent. So today, it's one of their beautiful awards, is the Young Economist Award, that rewards, you know, the career, basically, the beginning of the career of some of you. Every year, the committee receives a lot of application. I know that it sounds a bit deja vu to say, but it's true, it's hard to choose. In the end, a choice has to be made. And so I have the pleasure of having Mrs. Annalisa Aleati and Mrs. Silvia Campellini, from the, who is the director of the Research Foundation, to announce the 2023 winners of the Young Economist Award. When we call you, I would ask you please to come on stage. We'll briefly tell you who you are, and then we'll do a nice uh, picture together. Thank you, Maricela, and good morning, everyone. Actually, I mean, Maricela, probably we should hire you as our communication director because, I mean, you did an amazing job. I'm sure we'll get even more, you know. <laughs> New career. New career, yes, for you. So, well, 
I said, really, it's really an honor being here. And uh, without any further ado, I would go with the name of the winners of this edition. So a big round of applause to Federica Braccioli, <laughs> Marcus Eating, and Riccardo Marto. They are, yes, Federica Braccioli from the University of Geneva. She's having a postdoc at the Barcelona School of Economics, and she has won with a paper titled The Institutional Role of the Italian Mafia Enforcing Contracts When the State Does Not. So, congratulations, Federica. <laughs> Marcus, instead, I mean, we love this picture, right, Marcella? <laughs> Exactly. That's what we love of the young economists. Exactly. Yeah, he comes from Frankfurt, got university with a list of amazing positions like postdoc researchers and fellow at Mainz, Edelberg Institute of Global Health, Stanford Medicine. What else? No. no. <laughs> and he has won with a paper, Why Do We Discriminate? The Role of Motivated Reasoning. And last but not least, Ricardo Marto from the University of Pennsylvania, economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, who won with the paper titled Structural Change and the Rise of Markups. So as we cannot change our ceremony, I mean, this is just a little war for you, so you will remember us. Ricardo, Marcos, Ricardo. Picture. Pictures, exactly. Maristella, come oh, over, please. Picture. Let's do like this. Apologize for having jumped the gun to the uh, to, to the Unicredit Foundation and the association. I will not repeat the introduction, <laughs> so go ahead. Very much. Let's see. Does this work? Yeah, and you can hear me, yeah. Well, wow. Uh, so uh, it's a great pleasure and a huge honor to, to give this talk to begin with, but this presentation by Andrea was truly embarrassing. Uh, not only did I not recognize myself, I was trying to think, what am I going to talk about when he already gave my talk? Uh, because, uh, okay, so as I guess some of you know that Andreu is, is a real magician. Uh, there, is, uh, there is one proof that I do with uh, uh, Andreu and, and Sergio Hart on uh, axiomatization of the Shapley value, where whenever I get to it in class, I don't know if I told you, I look at the board and I say, oh my God, I forgot an axiom. That's not going to work because there's no way this is going to go out, and, and it works because, uh, because he's, he's a real magician. Um, and uh, we know each other for uh, slightly over uh, three and a half decades. Uh, the first time we met was when I was giving a job talk and I got a certain question that was a little bit embarrassing about, you know, what's the point of what I was doing or something. And I was at a loss for an answer, but Andrea came to my rescue. So uh, I hope today too, I'll keep saying things that are, <laughs> might not make sense, but you know, if there are any difficult questions, just ask him because he understands it's much better than I do. Uh, thanks a lot for the organizers, and uh, it's a wonderful conference. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is going to be a little bit of a general speech, more of the conceptual and uh, ideological issues, if you like, uh, that really accompany most of my academic life. Um, at the end, I'll try to present some uh, new work um, with... Um, uh, Stefania Minaudi of uh, HSE and uh, Fan Wang with the SEC. Um, I know I won't have too much time for this, and some of it is going to be a little bit too technical for the general audience, so I allow myself to just talk about the general theme. 
Uh, the general theme is um, there's no claim to uh, originality, as I'll try to say here, some of the ideas are a couple of hundred years old. Um, beyond that, there is a huge debt that I owe to David Schmeidler. I used to be David's uh, student, and uh, we've been working together for something like 40 years. And he sadly uh, passed away in um, 2022. Uh, <clears throat> so many of the ideas are, are joined with, with him and with other colleagues. Um, and he passed away, Larry Samuelson and others that I'll try to mention here. So I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, argue to claim an originality for the ideas. And the last sort of uh, apology is to say that uh, some of these discussions might be a little bit on the theoretical or even philosophical side, but I'll try to convince you that they do matter. Okay, so there's huge, beautiful philosophy behind it, but I think that uh, these things do matter to us today. I'll try to convey that message. So um, <clears throat> the main question that I'll start to I mean, the first part or the main part of the talk is going to be around the question of uh, does rationality imply Bayesianism? Uh, and um, what I'll try to say is, well, first of all, most economic theorists would say yes. I'll try to explain that a little bit. I'll try to challenge that. But in order to make the whole thing meaningful, I'll have to define both concepts. I'll have to say what rationality means and what Bayesianism means and a little bit about the history, especially of Bayesianism. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to economic theory and the implications, <clears throat> sorry. Along the way, I'll um, allow myself a little bit of digressions here and there. I'll hope not to uh, bore you too much. So let's start with the question of, of what is uh, rationality. So, uh, you know, in general, we could define things any way we like. In uh, classrooms, I often cite Humpty Dumpty, where at some point in his discussions with Alice, uh, she's saying that's a lot of meaning for one word, and he says my words mean whatever I want them to mean. If I want a word to mean more, I pay it extra. Okay, so Dodson was a logician, and he's saying no, there is no correct or incorrect definition, right? I mean, we could define things any way we like. So the question should be: Is it a useful definition? And that's the first, the, the main thing in which I'll try to suggest a definition is to say what's a useful definition for us. Um, Two caveats on this. Uh, one is that what I'm suggesting here is that the act of definition is basically a normative, normative science kind of activity. Like, namely, I say, hey, let's use this word in a particular way, okay? Because it's good to use it in a particular way. I'm going to suggest a definition, and I'm going to say this is useful for us. This would be practical for us. So basically, it's a normative statement. We should be using the term this way. I think there's also a descriptive aspect to it because we don't, you know, I'm not trying to use a term like a table and try to refer it. So I'm do, I am relying on what exists out there. So to an, an extent, when I define a term, there could also be an implicit claim that this is uh, how anyway we use it. Okay, so even if you think about terms like, you know, democracy or things like this, you have two aspects of those. And the other important caveat is that there is also the, the side of the the rhetoric of it, so that um, in principle, you know, if we're doing math, we could use any definition we like just to simplify the proofs, etc. So it's supposed to be very technical. In real life, words do come with a little bit of baggage. So there is a little bit of ideology here when I want to say that use this definition of rationality. My main claim is that it's going to be a useful definition. But in the background, there is a little bit of an ideological fight. So if you can see my political agenda here, that's fine. Um, so in older concept, you know, philosophers did not shy away in previous centuries from saying what uh, rational man, uh, cap M, not person, should do. Uh, there are many definitions of rationality. Weber distinguished among four different rationalizations. Uh, but Simon talked about procedural rationality. The standard definition we use in economics, like in textbook examples, is basically consistency. Okay, so we say that the behavior is rational if it is consistent, so we define things like, you know, complete and transitive preference order or something like that, and then we show that this kind of rational behavior is equivalent to utility maximization, and that's all we need. Um, there is the two things that uh, economics sort of have done here about 100 years ago. One is to um, look at, you know, follow the 
logical positivist approach of trying to say, well, something like utility should be defined by observables, and this is something that we see a lot in decision theory too. Uh, the other thing, if you like, is a little bit of a step back um, from you know, almost a postmodern step saying, you know, we're not going to tell you what is rational for, for, you, know, for you, we're just going to say, you know, to allow people to decide what should be in their utility function. Okay? So often we say in classes, we don't say what gets into the utility function, it's you know, this is consumer sovereignty or something like that. We are talking more about the form than the content when we talk about rationality. <coughs> And that's more or less how we teach that. What I'll try to suggest is maybe an even further step in this direction of saying not only are we not going to say what say are the ingredients of utility, but only talk about the consistency of choice, even the notion of consistency might be a subjective choice. Okay? Um, and here comes the somewhat descriptive part of it and in the um, I started thinking about it uh, back in 1990. I was uh, relatively young uh, and I went to a conference and I met the great Peter Fishburne. When I was a student, there were very few textbooks in decision theory and almost all of them were written by Peter Fishburne. And Peter Fishburne was presenting a model in which you had uh, intransitive choice, like really cyclical preferences. And there was a question about something like, you know, come on, how irrational could it be? And he said, there is nothing irrational about Transit, intransitive choices, like making choices in a cyclical manner. So, okay, and then I walked out of it saying, what does he mean? So that's the descriptive part, right? I mean, like, what does a great decision theorist like him mean when he say that there's nothing irrational about it? And I noticed over the years, I think many people, at least in decision theory, tend to think of uh, rationality as something that has to do with a discourse with the decision maker. Or at least that's the definition that I'm going to suggest now more on the normative side of defining things. Uh, something, a mode of behavior is uh, rational for a person, for a decision maker, if when confronted with the analysis of the decision, they're happy with this. They're not, don't want to change it or they don't want to feel, they don't, don't feel embarrassed as you know, the, the word that Amos Tversky suggested to me, that they don't, they're not embarrassed by the analysis of their decisions. And by analysis, I mean with not, not with any new information. I mean, if you make an investment and then you find out, get some information that it was a wrong investment, that's okay. That's fine. That's beyond rationality. You got new information. I mean, just the analysis or the kind of feeling that I should have known better. I could have known better. Okay? Um, the definition has lots of, of uh, disadvantages and lots of weaknesses. Let me try to mention them. First of all, it's subjective. Okay, so my, while something that can be rational for one person might not be rational for another person, and it can work in certain domains of in some decisions. Maybe transitivity is, is rational, and maybe in others less so. Uh, things become a little bit uh, subjective and context dependent. And it follows that they also become empirical. So if in the good old days I could sit in my office and look at the whiteboard and scribble some things and say, this is rationality, you know, transitive. Now I can't, now I have to go out and try to take information, sample you know, populations and see how embarrassed people are, to what extent they want to repeat it, I have no idea how to measure it operationally, even though there are some studies in the, in the literature that have tried things like that. Like, you know, Kahneman Tversky's works that sometimes confronted people with the axioms they violated and asked them, would they want to change? But by and large, it's, it's a messy thing, much messier than just sitting in, you know, at the office and scribbling things on the whiteboard. Right? Um, another thing that uh, sometimes bothers people is that uh, this notion of rationality is not monotonic in intelligence. Okay? And this is something that I discovered the hard way. I was teaching a class and I'm trying to teach something like expected utility for Neumann Morgenson axioms. So it's uh, useful often to get people to understand what the axiom means after they violated it. So I often, you know, I start with examples, say from Kahneman Tversky's work or something like that. And when people make the decisions that people often make, I tell them, you see, ha, you made the wrong decision because you made this decision here and that decision here. And now what do you make of this? And if they sort of feel uncomfortable, I say, well, I have a solution for you. Here is the axiom. That's the only way to satisfy it. Wonderful. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes I mean, you say, you see, you see, you made this decision here and that decision there, and they say, yeah. 
Okay, and then, um, okay, uh, you work hard to explain, and sometimes the message doesn't get across. Um, and if you try to apply my, my definition of rationality, you'd say that you know, that if you have two decision makers who make the same decisions, one of them is super intelligent, the other one a little bit less so, you explain the theory to them, the one who's super intelligent is intelligent enough to be embarrassed. The other one isn't, so the super intelligent is irrational and the less intelligent is not. Ha, okay. So um, now I have to de defend my definition and say that the last part actually I view as an advantage. Okay? Because I don't think that we decision theorists, economists, are in any way the preachers or the gurus, and I don't think we know how to tell people how to make decisions. So if we want to think that they're stupid, okay, fine, we can call them stupid, but I don't think that this gives us any right to tell them what the right thing to do for them, uh, especially if there's ethical issues here. Uh, I've gone through several um, um, hoops in the economic career. I haven't noticed that my uh, moral values were really tested. Okay, okay so I try not to plagiarize uh, things too clearly, so I was never caught plagiarizing. But beyond this, I don't think that anything in our profession gives us the right to tell people what's right to do. So the fact that this definition says these decision makers, whether they're individuals or societies, are the ultimate judges of what is right is actually an advantage for me. Okay? So that's, that last part I find is, is an advantage. Um, the main reason for this definition is, is, to, is its practicality, and uh, by this I mean the following. We live in very interesting times, okay? And um, if you think of curses, fine, but I think actually academically it is really a great period for a couple of decades in decision theory because we have two bodies of knowledge that are in some kind of conflict, not to say clash. I mean, there is something that was, I call the rational choice models, rational choice paradigms, not exactly rational choice theory, but I mean, this body of knowledge that includes microeconomics and operations research and decision theory and game theory that has, has its roots centuries back but was mostly developed in the middle of the 20th century. And I think it's a beautiful structure. I think it's really an, a wonderful intellectual structure, maybe on par with you know, Chomsky's linguistics or something like this in terms of the achievements, intellectual achievements of the 20th century. I think it's wonderful. I don't call it exactly a theory because uh, most of these things don't directly predict things. So we have, um, we have quite a bit of freedom when we look at models like this in mapping the concepts to reality. So let's take, a, for example, game theory. If I'm t telling you that there is a, a structure of a game and let's say we even talk about solution concepts, concepts such as Nash equilibrium, it doesn't directly tell us what's going to happen next in a certain situation. There are very few cases where the mapping is one-to-one, -one, but if I take, say, in uh, the case of uh, political uh, reality, it's not clear who the players are, what are the strategies, what the time periods, what they know, etc. There's a lot of freedom for the modeler to come and map things like uh, players and strategies and states of the world, etc., to real-life things. So that in some sense, you have a feeling that when it comes to political event, you could explain everything, right? And in some sense, probably true. Uh, Dave Krebs, um, new t the, uh, the textbook, chapters two and three are, are coming out and he's taking the more extreme view that game theory says nothing about the world, it's part of mathematics. I think it's a bit extreme. I think in certain situations of a game, it's pretty clear who are the, game, the players are, what are the strategies, it's going to be a little bit awkward to try to argue something completely uh, different. But it's certainly not a, a theory, and I think the same holds for decision theory. Classical general equilibrium theory to some extent, less so, right? Because we also, when we teach general equilibrium theory, we start with goods that are maybe tomatoes and cucumbers, and then we say, okay, let's put in uh, periods of time, let's put in states of the world. So we also have the freedom of interpreting what is a good in the theory. Game theory and decision theory have much more freedom. So in this sense, I would not call them specific theories, but you know, models in, with the in the book with David, we call it conceptual framework, something that needs something else, some kind of mapping to make it a refutable theory. Anyway, so let's, this is what I mean by rational choice, not rational choice theory, but rational choice something. 
and I think it's a beautiful structure. And on the other hand, there are all kind of findings from psychology, some of which have their roots in the 40s and the 50s, but mostly, you know, with the works of Kahneman, Tversky, and their followers, they really made a wonderful project of making like a systematic approach of showing that each and every axiom doesn't work. And as Amos first used to say, show me the axiom, I'll design the experiment that violates it. And, and this was not, you know, boasting. I mean, he, he had, and, and Danny have this, this talent. So what do we do? So we, I mean, we have this beautiful structure on the one hand, and we have this set of violations on the other hand. And one way is to say, well, you know, maybe we should do something else. Maybe we should study chemistry because I hear that this is a successful science. So that's an option. Uh, but we, if you we still want to be in the business of social science, then um, we have in bold strokes uh, two ways to deal with the gap between theory and the evidence. One is this, what's true also of the natural sciences and what the, you know, the Popperian thing is to say, well, if the theory is not good enough, let's make, bring it closer to reality. Okay? And that's in bold strokes what behavioral economics is trying to do, is to say, let's refine the theory in a Popperian sense and make it a better descriptive theory. In uh, our field, we also have the alternative and saying, wait, wait, maybe we should use the theory as a normative one and bring reality closer to the theory. Because there are certain things that we could change in this world. For instance, we know from uh, Kahneman Tversky studies that people confuse probability of A given B with B given A. Actually, anyone who ever tried to teach probability noticed this. It's a great thing to put on exams because otherwise students get too high grades. But you, <laughs> can, you could rely on them confusing probability of A given B with B given A. Um, I was even told that uh, somewhere uh, some state lottery was advertised by saying that um, 100% of the people who won the lottery bought a ticket. <laughs> <coughs> so, so that's one, of, one thing that we could do with it is to say, well, if people do confuse A given B with B given A, maybe what we should do is exploit this. Okay? So it could be the state lottery, it could be some you know, smart marketing people, etc. But there's another approach that says, would say, let's go out and teach people how not to get confused. Let's go back to high schools and teach them a little bit of probability of A given B, B given A. Some of it was done during the pandemic, by the way. You could hear people explaining this kind of Bayesian reasoning. Maybe we should teach them some other things like, you know, Condorcet paradox. Not so difficult to teach it, you know, people, kids at 11 can understand it perfectly well. Maybe we'll have a better world if we change it this way, okay? So, for the time being, of course, people are making these mistakes, but instead of accepting it as a fact and just exploiting this, maybe we should change this. And this means bringing evidence or bringing, bringing uh, reality closer to theory. Okay? Which should we do? Okay? And I claim that the definition of rationality I'm suggesting is sort of the watershed. This is sort of the, or like the litmus test, if you like, between the two approaches. If for most people, when I teach them the theory, they look at me and they say, yes, but, and they keep behaving the same way, then there's no hope for the normative thing, and I should accept it and just make the theory a better theory descriptively. But if when I explain it to them, you know, kind of framing effects or kind of uh, examples that they get, uh, people feel very silly about it and embarrassed, and I have a feeling that they're not going to make the decision differently next time, and this, by the way, also happened to me once, walking into a class where students have seen all the examples in a different class. <coughs> Pretty embarrassing to me, because you try the, the, all the Kahneman Tversky's uh, examples and nothing works, okay? And okay, so if it's exactly the same examples, I'm not trying to say this was exactly a controlled experiment, but you have a feeling sometimes that people who've seen it once are a little bit more aware of it, whether it's framing effect or conditional probabilities or something like that, then there is a hope to change it. Okay? And I think it's a useful definition of rationality because otherwise just to tell someone, look, I mean, if you can't play chess optimally, then you're irrational. Okay, so, you know, you call me irrational, you could also tell me, you know, that, uh, that um, I, t I talk nonsense and I look ugly and you could give me all kinds of things, but that's not gonna change my behavior in any sense. So, uh, this is why I'm su suggesting this definition of rationality. Okay. Uh, 
little digression that I'll need because I want also to refine the notion of rationality to objective and subjective, and this would have to do also with probabilities. So um, the notion of objectivity and subjectivity, uh, these are things that you know we could discuss a lot. Um, there is somewhere in Ansgar Bauman, whom Andrea mentioned, there is a statement about subjective probabilities, and they say that um, all probabilities are subjective. If they happen to coincide, we call them objective. And I just loved it. I thought this is a wonderful definition. You know, why bother about objectivity, the outside world, all this metaphysics of what exists outside my mind? I don't need that. Okay? If it so happens that we agree or what you say is the same thing that I feel, we call it just a nickname. Wonderful. And then uh, working with David uh, and, and writing this book, at some point we got to define it. And David gave this example and said, well, suppose that you know, we're discussing the width of this, of this hall. And you know, both you and I think it's 15 meters. OK, so according to this definition, it's objectively 15 meters. Now assume that there is also a meter that's stretched out. And it reads 15 meters. Okay? Don't you feel it's different? Okay? So I thought this is, yeah, this is something uh, different in this definition. And he's right. I mean, there's more ob to objectivity than just the mere coincidence of definitions, of uh, estimates. I would like to think of it as saying, well, if there is a meter out here, and let's say just uh, Maristella and I are here and looking at this, but if there is a meter and both of us think it's 15 meters, we also believe that should Andrell now come in, he would say 15. Okay? Whereas if we don't have this, we have uncertainty about what he's going to say. So I refer to objectivity as second order subjectivity. It's still my subjective estimate, but now of what others people would, other people would say. And we could even make it very practical. Let's say that we're going to have a bet. We're going to sample 10 people out of the street. We're going to ask them to estimate the width of the room. Let's hope they'll be truth telling or whatever, or give, incentivize them somehow. And then we're going to bet on the sigma of the sample. If we take 10 people and there is a meter stretched out here, I guess most of us would agree that zero for sigma is not a bad guess. Um, but otherwise, it's a, it's a wild guess. Anyway, so that's the way I'd like to think about subjectivity, about uh, objectivity, namely just what do we believe is shared by others. And it has a little bit to do with this notion of Habermas' notion of communicative rationality. Uh, his notion has a lot more democratic values in it and I have nothing against democratic values. I'm just trying to separate the two, two issues. So, um, trying to, uh, at some point, we're trying to refine this notion of rationality and try to dis distinguish between objective and subjective rationality. Uh, it, this is like in one paper with uh, Massimo Marinacci and Fabio Maccheroni. We use this structure, and I won't go into the details of the paper, just to say that the basic structure there is to have a decision maker with more than one preference relation, two of them. Um, the star thing is supposed to be the objectively rational, and the um, hat thing, if you like, is the um, subjective one. The interpretation we'd like you to carry in mind when you think about it is to say that the decision is objectively rational if I can convince any reasonable decision maker that this is the right decision. So obviously when I say reasonable decision maker, I'm trying to highlight the fact that this is going to be an empirical question. It's going to be very difficult for me to actually measure it. It depends on the decision and the population and their education and, and a lot of a lot of details like that. But the idea is that I'm sort of on the offense. I'm coming there to the decision maker's office and I'm trying to say, this is what you should be doing. Okay? And the question is, will I succeed in that? Subjective rationality is closer to the, what I was saying before, is when the decision maker is on the defense, if you like. Okay? The decision maker makes the, her decisions and the question is, can I try to make her embarrassed about them? A decision is subjectively rational if that's not the case. Okay? If the decision maker can defend her choices and feel okay about it, then I would say it's subjectively rational. Objective rationality demands more. And um, what we believe typically would be the case, but it's also in this paper with Fabio and Massimo, uh, when we think of the axioms that these would hold, would satisfy, the objective rationality would typically satisfy stronger axioms apart from completeness, apart from the fact that any two things can be compared. 
Okay, so completeness is the, the assumption that we usually put there because of necessity, because decisions have to be made. The objective rationality thing is what I can convince anyone of. There might be lots of situations where I cannot make a decision. On the other hand, since decisions have to be made, and I don't want these decisions to be made you know, outside of my model, God knows what's going to happen when we are done with the model and the decision maker now makes her own choices, I want these choices to be put forth and I'm, I'd like to see them here. So on the, this one, I would impose this completeness. I want a decision to be seen there, but this comes at a price that some of the rationality assumptions or consistency assumptions that we typically have are going to be weaker. Okay. So just to give an example, if I think of something as basic as tra transitivity, personally I would find it very reasonable for both, but I would read it differently. Because when I think about transitivity in the case of uh, the subjective rationality, it's really a property of the entire relation. So the decision maker sits there and she fills out the matrix of A over B, B over C, blah, blah, blah. And I look at the matrix and I say, oh, I spotted a cycle here. Okay? So if I spotted the cycle, I can try to make her perhaps embarrassed about it. And I believe that most people would feel bad about it. And I could tell the decision maker, really, you don't want this bad press of you know, how you made decisions in a cyclical way. So no matter what you do, just don't be caught red-handed with a cycle in your preferences. So that's the way I would read sensitivity there. With objective de definition, it's, uh, the objective rationality is different. I would think of it as if there is good reason to prefer A over B. Think about you know, vaccination policies or something like that, and say A is objectively rational over B because in a sense that there is some objective reasons. Maybe scientific data, statistical analysis, people waving their hands, I don't know. But at the end of the day, there is a proof that A is better than B. And then transitivity becomes like a way of concatenating proofs to generate a new one, like an axiom system in, in logic, in the sense that if I have a proof that A is better than B, and I have a separate proof that B is better than C, here comes transitivity to concat the two, concatenate the two and give me a proof that A is better than C. Okay, so it's, it's a really different way of, of reading it. Um, and generally, we'd like to think about them as, as two separate things with the obvious uh, relationship that at least you know, what you could objectively convince people of should also be what they are should be satisfying in the subjective rationality ratio. Um, I'll take a, another very quick digression to say that in some sense, I think this relates a little bit to two uh, issues of how, how do we deal with the decision theory or what's, what's good about decision theory. That's another um, political agenda I'd like to promote. Um, so, you know, I teach often in you know, economics and business schools and sometimes, you know, you meet MBA students and they don't think that they should study decision theory and that's very bad for my business. So I'm trying to convince them they should. The line of reasoning that said we don't need it goes along the lines of saying, well, other some decisions are solved I and mean, some problems are solved. So for instance, ways, you know, solve the problem of getting from point A to point B. And at least we'd like to believe so. Recently it worked a little less well, but generally, you know, you have this app. We know how to solve it. We have the maps. We have real life data on, on, on traffic. We have the algorithms for shortest path. And if you put it on your phone and your phone tells you to go left, you just go left. Don't try to go right because it knows better. And I think this fits like the, the founding father's dream of how to use decision theory, operations research, etc., in finding the right solution. There's an objective function, there are constraints, we can figure them out, we put it in an algorithm, you get the answer, don't argue. But this also means that you don't have to think about it, okay? So if you're a student and you say, fine, I mean, everyone, you have a programmer who's done it once, and now we all have it on our phones, and then I don't need to study this. Indeed, you know, there's no point in going to business people and try to just teach them Dijkstra's algorithm of shortest path, because they say, what's the point? I mean, it's programmed, right? The other problems, like, you know, people say, you know, what should I invest, with? how should I invest my money? And I say, and they say, well, uh, if you have money to invest, you probably know something I don't. So uh, who am I to tell you what to do with your money? Um, so evidently, most of these decisions require some intuition. But then say, if you don't have the answer from your model, then let's forget about it. Okay, I'll trust my own intuition. In both cases, I don't need to study the theory. Either it's programmable or it doesn't help. Okay. So as I said, I have vested interest in saying that's not the case. 
but I truly believe that many decisions could be aided by decision theory in a sense that you have your intuition as the decision maker, but there might be a decision theory who are going to help you to work through the details and see how consistent you are. The extreme point of this uh, dialogue between decision makers and decision theorists, I would say, you're about to make your decision. A minute before you do it, let's take the minutes of your decision. We'll write down what decision you're going to make, but I'll write down a decision theoretic model that supports it. Okay? So we'll try to sit together and find utility function, states of the world, whatever it is that we need to support your decision. And you know, in my ideal world, any politician who makes a decision for others would have to write down the minutes of the meeting and to justify that decision post hoc, um, because I think this process helps you to understand what you do your decision better. So in a, in a paper with two colleagues from uh, Ashes at the time, Siboni uh, and Ruzio, we, uh, we call this thing be uh, decision theory between software and the shrink where the software is this app on your phone that just tells you what to do and you don't argue, and the shrink is this, you know, the decision theory is you're sitting there and try to say, let's see, you know, maybe my beliefs are extreme, maybe my utility is this, etc. Okay, so that'll be more along the line of the subjective one. Uh, let's talk about the Bayesian approach a bit. So the Bayesian approach is, as we know, it's about formulating a state space and it's about uh, the main thing, uh, the states should resolve all uncertainty in the way we try to think about it. Formulating a prior probability is the key thing and the update, I think, is the thing that people tend to agree on most. You know, okay, psychologists always would find some violations and there will always be a philosopher who says, wait a minute, I'm not so sure normatively, but by and large, people accept Bayesian updating, if there is a prior, people accept Bayesian updating as the thing to do. The big argument is whether we have a probability or not. Um, very short digression on this. Um, so there is, as we all know, there's classical statistics and there's Bayesian uh, statistics and that is getting more popular in recent decades. Um, I think it's helpful especially to tell our students um, how the two relate and why economics is a little bit, um, might seem a bit schizophrenic, it's not, but I think it might seem a bit schizophrenic in the following sense. Um, when we do um, empirical studies, for the most part, we still test hypotheses and there are stars and et cetera, and this is, this is significant, this is not significant, right? Um, the Bayesian, the agents in our model tend to be Bayesian, okay? So when we do research as researchers, we, for the most part, we're classical, but the, our agents are Bayesian, okay? And why is that, okay? Why, how do we reconcile the two? So um, let me go to, uh, try to ridicule for a bit the Bayesian approach in uh, this situation for hypothesis testing. When I was a student, it was very common to explain hypothesis testing with a court case, and I'm still trying to figure out why I'm trying to try to talk to some people in law, why exactly they, is this accurate or not. But I think that the idea that you're, you're trying to prove the defendant is guilty and you allow them the benefit of the doubt in the court case, I think it will help works well with students to understand the asymmetry between the two hypotheses. Uh, and okay, of course we pay a price uh, when we don't have beliefs over H0 and H1, neither before nor after the sample, and we pay a price, we make up all kinds of words that are based on probabilities, confidence and significance, and sometimes spend a lot of time to e explain to our students why they're not probabilities, they never were probabilities, they never are probabilities, but what does it really mean? It's a, it's a mess. The Bayesian alternative is very nice in terms of coherence I and mean, nothing I think approximates its um, logical and conceptual beauty. But in this case, we can understand why it's not going to be a very useful approach because, you know, suppose that I'm a defendant and I uh, get into court and it so happens that the, uh, the judge is my mom and my mom says that my son, my son could not have done it. She puts zero prior on me being a killer and that's it and I go out free, which is great, of course. But then comes the thought, well, maybe well, if it's not my mom, it'll be someone who has a prior who is very much against me, and then who knows, and then I don't want it, okay? I don't want this subjectivity, 
okay? As I, what I expect the court system is to strive to objectivity. Now I know it's not going to be obtained, okay? Ob objectivity is not a place, but it is a direction. And we sort of hope things to be more objective. And that's very, that's a big problem for the Bayesian approach because the Bayesian approach wants to quantify anything. As I walk into the, the courtroom, the judge should have some probability on me being the, the murderer, okay? And this couldn't be terribly objective before having seen the data, okay? So uh, this, um, explains, I think, why the Bayesian uh, alternative can be problematic. I think we can also push this a little bit further to understand this tension, not to say schizophrenia of our profession in the following sense. Suppose that I'm sitting there in a, I'm a, on a jury in some court uh, case, and there is this uh, person who's accused of killing someone, let's say accused of killing his girlfriend, and uh, somehow everyone tends to believe that he has really done it, but you know the evidence here was not quite uh, uh, obtained properly, and this and that, etc. At the end of the day, the jury decides that we have to acquit the person. And after this long day, I come back home and I see my daughter uh, you know, putting up some makeup, and I say, "Hey, honey, what are you doing?" And she says, "I'm going out on a date," and asks, "Who are you ever dating?" And it turns out the same to be the same guy. And I tell her, oh, no, honey, you're staying home tonight, don't even think about it. And I'm trying to say this is perfectly coherent. It's perfectly coherent for me as a juror to say, as far as objective evidence is concerned, I don't think this has passed a certain threshold. At the same time, when it comes to my daughter, then let's say my daughter is myself for the sake of the argument, I don't need to prove anything to anyone. Okay? So part of the reason that we have this distinction between the two the classical approach, with all its difficulties, attempts to be objective. Nothing is objective, but this is the goal, okay? The Bayesian approach attempts to incorporate intuition, and I will try to say that this is also not a perfect approach in this sense. Nothing is perfect in capturing our intuition, but the goals are completely different. So when we're trying to do research, empirical research, and convince the scientific community that we found some data, empirical research should tr strive to be objective. It's a, another case in which I'm trying to convince society of some fact, that the defendant is guilty, that the product is flawed, that I have found some scientific data. I'm st the context is one in which I'm trying to convince people in society. I know that they have different beliefs. I know that they have different incentives to pretend they have different beliefs or whatever. The rules of the game are when do we say that we've proven something in society? And this applies to the scientific research. When I'm making a decision for myself, I don't need to report anything to anyone. I'm not reporting to you, I'm just making the decision for myself, like my daughter dating, dating or not dating this guy. And in this case, it's a completely different goal. Okay. Okay, so is it rational to be Bayesian? A few words on what Bayesianism is and the, and the history. So I didn't put much on Pascal because uh, especially when I get so, so excited, I could now speak for half an hour on Pascal's wager. It's amazing. Okay, so uh, what Pascal said and what he didn't say because uh, some people, including uh, unfortunately a textbook of mine and Wikipedia, give you the impression that Pascal threatened you with burning in hell, which he didn't. Okay, Pascal only talked about the positive things that you know, if God exists and you become a believer, become a believer. Okay, also you don't just start to believe. So he describes the process by which you become a believer. And you know, his sister joined the monastery that he nearly did also. So he, wants, he separates very nicely between the acts that you have control over and the states of the world that you don't have control over. And he's starting to sell this idea of believing in God because you're going to get the afterlife by the notion of a dominant strategy. Because he said, if God doesn't exist, it costs you nothing. And then he goes on in this argument with this putative interlocutor and he says, and if you say that you lose some benefits from being a sinner, well, you know, it doesn't pay off because everything that awaits you down on earth is finite. And given the fact that he's one of the main people who invented probability and expectation calculations in the context of risk, it's pretty obvious that he's talking about expected utility, maximize expected utility in a very sophisticated way because it's, the payoffs are not even monetary, and the probability is subjective. The probability that God exists, Pascal uses the terms uh, bet at any odds, but 
the fact that the God exists, this is not card games. This is not some re re relative frequencies that you could repeat or something. Okay? So what he's talking about is put probability that we, namely he and you know, the Moivre and a few others, invented a few years back. Cardano was, had some things about 100 years before, but never mind. Let's not ruin the story. So probability, objective probability was just invented for the case of gambling, and he was already using it as a way to make sense of your decisions. Okay, so you have a decision to become a believer or not, and he's using the structure of probability theory to make this a more rational decision. Okay? And the probability has to be subjective because it's not about you know, repeated universes or something like that. So it's, it's really a fantastic idea. And towards the end he says, and what happens if you don't even know the probability, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so expected utility theory um, then was m explicitly suggested uh, by the uh, Bernoullis. Um, so it was uh, the, the, um, mostly by Daniel Bernoulli, also uh, and Cremer uh, before him. So he was trying to solve the St. Petersburg paradox of uh, Nicolaus, his cousin. Um, oh, Bayes himself is not here, or was he before? Anyway. Bayes came on stage, uh, and we usually uh, cite in the, you know, the mid 18th century, we usually cite uh, 1763 or 4, uh, posthumous. And uh, the argument that Bernoulli was using was again about God. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting that um, the, the theory actually waited so long, and there are books written about why probability theory waited so long. Uh, and in classes, uh, I often uh, cite here uh, Maristella's book with uh, Eckstein, uh, because if you go back to earlier times, like you no know, biblical times, when I go out to um, have a war and I want to win the battle, uh, what I do is take a sheep and slaughter it. Okay? And this is a way you sacrifice something to God, and if I don't eat the sheep, then God is going to give me victory. Okay? This was the way to deal with the future. This has a serious breakup, as uh, Maristella and Zvika actually described with the destruction, destruction of the temple, no more sacrifice. And then uh, Judaism became a religion of prayer and, and studying, and this is true of Christianity from the beginning. So the way to negotiate with the future is to pray or to promise things to God, to take oaths and to you know, torment myself, to fast and so on. And this is basically how humans dealt with the future for a long time. And the common theory is that somewhere you know, between the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, uh, people started to think of themselves as the agents that have to do with the future, and this is where probability theory started. Maybe if you like social science more generally. Okay, so it's a way that humans decide, okay, I'm still dealing with it. So that's a standard theory, story as to why probability theory waited so long. It's still interesting that the greatest ideas still were c coming from theology. So Pascal was still talking about whether to become a believer or not, and Bayes, according to this book by McGrain, uh, came up with the Bayesian update in the context of trying to prove that God exists. Okay? So um, I know that um, proper English should, should tell, grammar should tell me that I should, he was trying to prove that God existed, but I don't want to get into trouble, so I you know, sacrificed grammar here. That he try, was trying to prove that God exists. And, uh, and the, way, the argument is very much like the intelligent design argument uh, that is common in the States today, or what's known in philosophy as the watchmaker argument that basically says, look at the wonders of the world. It's so amazing if you look at the planet, and if you, today you know, we could look at the mysteries of the brain and the DNA and so on. So it's so fantastic, and if God exists, this is certainly what we would see. The probability of the world given God is one, let's say God of the scriptures. Otherwise, you have to say, well, you know, coincidence here, coincidence there, mutations, uh, basically, you know, a lot of... Now, the probability of finding the world without God is very small. But Bayes wanted to prove that given the world, God exists. The fact that the world, given God, has prob high probability doesn't mean that the, world, the, the other way around, that God, given the world, has high probability. For this, you need to do the calculation and you need a prior. And Bayes used 50-50.
Okay, so you use 50-50 and uh, the argument worked. But uh, you also invented Bayesian update. It was invented in this context. And the, the commitment to quantify everything probabilistically. Okay. And this is still why we call it the Bayesian approach, because this is the way he did it then. Okay, uh, the argument was revived in the A uh, about 100 years ago. Ramsey and Definetti were very much for the Bayesian approach. Um, Knight and Keynes were very much along the line saying, no, it can't, uh, not everything can be quantified. Fonomen Morgenstern didn't deal with this specifically. There were about known probabilities, but there were obviously a very important st stepping stone. And then came Savage and Anscombe and Aumann that basically convinced the profession or professions that the only rational way to make decisions is the Bayesian one. Okay. So um, again, influenced by logical positivism, the works here you know, of Ramsey of Definetti were trying to say, what is subjective probability? Well, we relate it to observables. The observables are, let's say, betting. Okay, would you bet on this, bet on that? Incidentally, Pascal also was a bet. Uh, and then if you put some axioms about consistency there, you find out that the only rational way, to, or the only way to satisfy the axioms is by um, being Bayesian, behaving as if you have a certain probability such that what you do is consistent with maximization of expected utility. Um, I mentioned briefly about axiomatizations that we want typically to relate the uh, theoretical concept to observables, again, along the lines of, um, uh, along the lines of logical positivism that is trying to convince us that, you know, to make sure that what we're doing is really science and to say, how do you measure it? How do you refute it? And so on. Um, I mentioned briefly that many of these results are really not so much in economics, but more about the work of the economist. Okay? And there are actually many beautiful results that are mathematical results that we find sometimes are called foundational. They're trying to tell us whether something is or is not going to work, whether a certain model is, is, has certain properties or not. For instance, whether, a certain, uh, whether something is impossible. Take Arrow's impossibility theorem. Right? It doesn't say much about reality. I mean, if Arrow were to prove his theorem in Sparta 2,600 years, 2600 years ago, you might say this is a normative statement, right? If you move his theorem back to Sparta, you could say, look at these Athenians, they are crazy with the democracy. Let's forget about it. Let's do what we do. Uh, but that's not, that wasn't the context, okay? So Arrow did it in the 50s in, in this US, and it's clear that it's not saying anything about reality. Okay? It doesn't say, oh, you know, the U.S. doesn't satisfy these axioms uh, in its constitution, or France doesn't satisfy these axioms in the constitution. It says something about if you're trying to devise a system, don't even bother to look at these kind of things. Okay? So it's really, the audience is really other economists. But these kind of things can be very powerful. I will not say much about Savage apart from the fact it's beautiful. And it's very beautiful because of what we don't see here. And Savage didn't use any math, uh, any math concept, no topology, no algebraic, no uh, linear structure or anything like this. And comes the theorem that says that if you satisfy the axioms, you have to behave as if you're maximizing expected utility based on some utility and some probability, both of which are derived from your preferences, therefore subjective. It's an amazingly beautiful. I mean, I'm teaching it for more than three, 30 years, and I'm still getting excited because I think it's, it's just an amazing theorem in terms of the conceptual import, and the math is not simple. And yet, and yet I find it problematic. So I'm trying to say why I find it problematic. One thing that sort of uh, bothers me is that, uh, not only me, uh, others as well, if it's so rational, why is it not objective? So suppose that Andreo and I have a debate about you know, the probability of uh, financial crisis, and he says it's going to be 0.4, and I say, no, it's 0.6. And you know, we could part as friends because we have subjective probabilities, and that's fine. Um, on my way back, I would ask myself, why couldn't I convince him? He's a super smart guy, so why couldn't I convince him? Shouldn't I be bothered by the fact that he was not convinced by my 0.4, 0.6? I mean, so the, the meta level, the question is, how rational could it be if I cannot convince a, a reasonable decision maker? Um, Arbodites and cyclophines. So let's say you walk down campus and you see this uh, sign that says that there is a talk about Arbodites and cyclophines and you never heard the terms. I made them up. Okay. 
so you no idea. I'm asking you, what is your probability that all the albodites are cyclophines? Okay, that the albodites are sub. Now, if you're Bayesian, you should have a number, okay? <laughs> and you never heard the terms. You don't know whether these are ancient languages or whether these are enzymes. We don't even know which department this uh, talk belongs to. And you're supposed to have a number on this. So I tried it on some colleagues, and they said, well, you know, 0.5, okay? <laughs> then I said, okay, but what about cyclophines being a subset of arbodites? What about the two being disjoint? What about the two being logically impulsive? What about meta-arbodites being a subset of pseudo cyclophines? I mean, we could make up words like this. And I think that the feeling that we all have in our bones is that I just don't know. I don't have the foggiest idea. Don't try to ask me, do I not know 0.8 or do I not know 0.81? I just don't have any idea. Okay. And there's a nice quote by Keynes in 37 when, in his comments on general theory where he talks, says precisely this about a financial crisis. He said, we simply do not know. And this is what I mean by saying that the Bayesian approach doesn't have it in the language. Okay. You cannot say I have no idea. You have to quantify how much idea you don't have. Okay. And that's, that's, I think, a, um, a problem. Now, of course, things vary. It's not a zero one. You got the coin coming up ahead, we can talk about it and whether 0.5 makes sense there or not and under what conditions. I can have situations where my car being stolen where I can look at good empirical data. Talking about the surgery is more complicated because there are no two cases are alike. Never. Two cases are never alike, but you know, we could, it's, a, it's a convenient assumption if I toss the coin or talk about the car, no big deal. But if it's my own body, come on, I mean, I'm really special, which is not a great thing, but we all want to be special, but not, you know, if you're in, looking at the surgery and your doctor says to you, oh, you're so special. Uh, that's, uh, whether there's going to be war or financial crisis or things like this, we have, you know, even less and less uh, evidence to, to base it on. And the point is that sometimes we want to say, look, we just don't know and we want this to be in the language, okay? Importantly, so when I talk about arbodites and cyclophines, then um, this sounds like a very silly discussion that might fit some, you know, uh, philosophical discussion or something. But this is where I'm trying to say this is very real, okay? Uh, let's talk about now climate change. Now, I'm not talking about wars because wars are so hard to explain and political science is not exactly an exact science and, you know, who knows who's going to do what and we're talking about world leaders and their personalities. I don't expect anyone to come up with a scientific uh, estimate of, of that probability. But climate change, we're talking about real physics, okay? And it turns out that different groups of geophysics who are trying to, physicists, who are trying to estimate the increase in temperature vary to a great degree. So there was some collation in uh, Science of 2009 that was cited by paper in 2014. And here this is a, a master's uh, dissertation by a student at uh, HSA, Sven Koron. So he just uh, did this... Um, you know, meta study just to go over published papers. Uh, the papers are here, so I'm, I'm sure this is too small to see. The point is, the, one of the main uh, estimates that people are looking at is what's going to be the uh, main, the average increase in temperature around the globe. The globe. Okay. So we know it's going to be, you know, something is random here, so they're estimating the density. And here are different estimates, and you see they vary quite a bit. And this is under some assumptions on human behavior, because of, typically in these kind of studies, say, okay, human policy is how to predict, but let's assume that we do business as usual. Let's assume we do this or do that. And the rest of it is just physics. And it's not quantum physics, okay? For the most part, you know, this is physics they all agree on, but it turns out there are many details in these estimates that in, in your modeling, and you run very sophisticated computer programs on this, eventually different assumptions in modeling give you different estimates, okay? None of these people is a climate denier, okay? All of them believe in science. All of them believe that, uh, that we are facing global warming. How much it's gonna be is still a matter of, of uh, debate. And now the question is, if I believe that the only rational thing to do is to be Bayesian, then I ask the policymaker, uh, let's say the politician, to say, okay, so I'm put probability on that, okay? And as I'm trying to say, the probability is gonna be very subjective. And to go back to what I was trying to say before, I don't like this idea that these politicians who are making decisions for us would think that, you know, okay, so 
let's come up with some number, 0.5 or whatever, just because I was told that the only rational thing to do is Bayesian. I would prefer to be there in the room and say, you know, there are more approaches than just the, the Bayesian one. Let's see which approach is convenient, which approach is something that you could uh, use. And for this, I think we have to have more than one decision model. We have to have a selection of decision models in which people can find, you know, something that's sort of they find comfortable with. Uh, and that's the other part of what I said about uh, decision theory supporting your decision. It's not just the actual decision that's a dialogue that's a, to be discussed. I think it's the language of the dialogue itself. I want us as decision theorists to be able to say, okay, you don't feel comfortable with probabilities. Well, okay, we have some models without a single probability. Or you don't feel comfortable with states of the world. Maybe we could do something else, okay? Um, I won't have time for much of a discussion. Oh, yeah, never mind. Oh, so I, I am. There is still on the, on the conceptual side of how do I reconcile Savage's beauty with all this. So uh, we've actually a couple of papers that we've written on this mostly, I mean, with, with David Schmeiler, of course, and uh, Andy Postlewaite and Larry. Uh, the key culprit is the state of the world. Okay, the key culprit is that if the state of the world is there and observable, things look much, make much more sense. The axioms are much more um, meaningful. Very often, the, key, the state of the world is something we construct theoretically, and this is where things get a little bit shaky. Okay, so Savage's model looks beautiful and convincing. In real life, some of the states of the world are not even observable. So if you, you want to know how do I reconcile these, I'll do it some other time. Uh, other approaches, so David Schmeidler pioneered this, uh, the idea of non-additive probabilities, or also known as capacities, with this Choquet integral. Not, not always uh, so easy to explain, but also has this thing that you need to see the states and sometimes how they're in applications. Then there's the approach of the max-min expected utility, which in some case overlaps. And uh, it has one advantage, maybe it's simpler to explain, but also that you don't have to see the state space in order to apply it. Okay, you could take any model that you use, no matter what are the variables, and say, here's one parameter that varies in a certain range, and you automatically get a set of probabilities, as in classical statistics, like you know, confidence set, and you could do max-min over that. Max mean sounds extreme, so you have a couple of other models, in particular the um, smooth preferences of uh, Klebanov, Marinacci, and Mukherjee, which says maybe I have probabilities over probabilities. And you say, wait a minute, probabilities over probabilities give you probabilities. So, yes, right, I mean, they know that, but they put here some nonlinear function so that when you compute the expected utility of, of an alternative, According to a given probability, before you integrate all this, you apply some nonlinear function and you get a set of models that can explain more and some people may also feel more comfortable with. Another approach uh, following the, the works of Hansen and Sargent and uh, just variational preferences, sort of generalizing this. Okay, I should stop. So uh, I didn't get to tell you about the new, new works uh, with um, Stefania and Fan, I'm sorry. Um, the general message, I, um, I'll just repeat it, is that if we use a practical definition of rationality instead of just calling people irrational until we're blue in the face, uh, but something that can, we hope to change their minds or change their behaviors, then I think we have to go beyond the Bayesian approach. The Bayesian approach is beautiful, it's very elegant, very convincing, but in some cases it's going to be so remote from what we have uh, in front of us that we have to allow for the possibility there are more notions of rationality. The decision makers are the ones who are supposed to feel comfortable with their decisions, and for this we need more than one decision model. I'll stop you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll now go to lunch, but I'm sure that Professor Gilbo will be happy to answer any question that any of you may have while taking a coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.